So, when I was plotting out Keyship Series 5, honestly, I couldn't think of anything else this series needed more than another unbuilt carrier. But, once again, I was thinking, Alex, there's a theme you've got going on here, and it would be a shame not include the Joffre class in it, because we're talking about carriers built by medium powers. The Malta is built, is being designed by a power who, as much as they probably don't, wouldn't want to admit it, realize that they're going to have issues. That with the uh, growing status of the United States, whilst they're going to still maintain a lot of diplomatic status and a lot of capabilities, as long as they, they presume they're going to have some continued investment in defense, they will be very capable, but they realize they might not have as many ships or even equivalency as they used to with the Americans. So what they need is something which is reliable. They need guaranteed capability that they can project around the world when they need to project it. So British word still has substance behind it, but not so uh, not you know so expensive that they can't keep it going. CVA one, Britain really much really does realise it is a second tier power compared to the superpowers which are the first tier. But it thinks it is at the top of that second tier. It doesn't just think it is. It is. It's got four aircraft carriers. It's got the world's second largest, na second most powerful navy after the United States at the time. There is no real question on that front. Britain's number two. And let's be honest, for a nation, being number two is powerful. Okay, it's not as powerful as being number one, but number two, there's a capability there. There's a security there. There's an advantage there. It means you're the number one's best friend when they're talking about naval matters. Because you're the one most able to assist them. If they're happy to be assisted. Which is what gets us to the Joffre class. Because... Well, France is... France is a mess in the 1920s and 30s. Let's be honest. I have talked about this at several points. Honestly, sometimes I see comments which have very reasoned and thought-out ideas for why the French are making decisions they're making. And they are right. Those are very good and reasoned ideas. The trouble is there's no record or evidence that France is actually having that kind of reasoned... Uh, discursive, inclusive, but most importantly, frank, open, and willing to upset debate about defence. In fact, defence debate in France in the 1920s and 30s is full of electioneering slogans and platitudes for how great France is, for how great their marshals were. No one's willing to really look closely at those marshals and go, hang on. How good really were you in World War One? No, they were great. They they made the necessary tough decisions. The necessary decisions, yes, they cost so many lives, but they were doing the right thing and those lives were lost in a just cause because look how many we lost. If they weren't lost in a just cause doing the right things, then honestly that just makes the horror of what we just had to go through even worse. And you have all that up there. And into this scenario steps the burn, which I've discussed on this channel far too often, but for a small, small time I will explain. It's a converted Normandy-class battleship, which was originally designed to have turbine power so it could get a higher speed and maintain that speed, but someone worked out that that would, cost money, uh, that would mean that they would be upsetting a key supplier of engine components. So they decided to make it have two triple expansion engines and one turbine. So they didn't even got high speed or no fuel economy. They got nothing. Um, someone decided that they were going to 
really, really have some really very smart ideas about how to operate aircraft carriers, which made its operation overly complicated, absolutely horrendously slow, and probably the most... You just... Look, it, it, the, the trouble is, you can look at all the solutions and you can go, on their own, they are engineeringly amazing ideas, and they're engineeringly very good ideas. However, cumulatively as a whole, there are so many brilliant engineering ideas that it is a maintenance and utility nightmare. At no point has anyone gone, is there a very simple, very straightforward method of doing this, that is less than perfect, but works at a vast majority of the time. If so, let's go with it. Instead they went, aha, no, we have a better idea. Constantly. The good idea theory was incredibly liberal when they were reconfiguring the burn into an aircraft carrier. I can say the only, only good thing that happens in terms of French uh, development is that in 1923, when a naval staff requested that they get another carrier similar to the Bern, it was rejected. It was re rejected, though, on grounds not of it's horrendously to operate, are you sure? Not on grounds of... Have you seen what you've built? You want something the same as this? No. It's rejected on grounds of being too expensive. Instead, they created a seaplane carrier, the Commander Test, uh, Commandant Teste. In 1928, the Marine Nationale's life was made massively more difficult with the formation of the Ministry de l'Air, the Air Ministry. Copying the British, they immediately transferred all naval aviation to the new ministry. However, the Marine Nationale managed to regain control of naval aviation after it stagnated for a few years in 1936. So they lost it later than the British, and they managed to recover it more quickly. Hooray, there is a good thing going on here in naval aviation terms. And I am going to do a shameless book plug because, well, this is my book. I put this in every video. Why? Because I'm a young academic, and I'm not only self-publishing writing a couple of books which I'm hoping to publish on Kindle and other similar e-reading devices um, which I'm funding all the pictures for etc so I can write some short introductory roughly 45 50,000 word books on things like the flower class corvettes and U-class submarines in service of the Royal Navy and some th various third sea lords and directors of naval construction I just want to write a series which I'm loosely entitled, in, in, loosely entitling in my head, Introductions to. Aimed at sort of, well, aimed rather like this book was at. At providing a book which could be your first academic book in terms of its referencing, and it's going to have that level of detail so you can go and do further research. But is also easy to read and hopefully gives all the background information. So if it is your first book you're reading in terms of naval history, you're going to have the stuff explained to you in there. You're going to have the explanation of what the, how radar works and the systems that are in there. Because one of the fun things I have with some history books that come out is they do assume a lot of knowledge on part of the reader. Which makes them very bad books for someone to read for the first time. Especially when they compound that by not having, I would say, easily accessible reference points for them to go, for the reader to go and find out more should they wish. So that's what my book is, and that's what the books I'm trying to write are. 
But that all costs money. And also I have this other affliction, I'm human, which means I like to eat. And money helps with these things. So, please, if you'd like a good book about destroyers, I will highly recommend this. And it's not just because it's my first, and therefore it's kind of like my personal baby, in, ter in terms of written form. It's also because, whilst I haven't succeeded in turning my PhD thesis into a book, because honestly I was told there were too many books about aircraft carriers in the world at the time when, it was, when I was trying to put it around, this is a product of that research. Because it was the little sh the ships in this book which kept turning up time and time again as a sort of idealised carrier escort for the Royal Navy at the time when they were looking at their carriers. Anyway. Into the Joffre class. Now, one thing I will say, thank the Lord, they've not got three different types of lift this time. The Burn had a lift for its fighters, a lift for its bombers, and a lift for its scout aircraft. Again, I, I have no idea what was going through the designer's brains at that point in that uh, in that uh, ship design, and none of those lifts were fast moving. Okay, none of them were fast. So, yeah, something happened. Okay, is the 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 burn was basically someone said we have all these ideas for uh, for uh, for an aircraft carrier. What would you like to try out? And the response by someone was, why choose? Let's try it all. Magnanimous, but produces a mess. Anyway, the French in the 1930s are worried about the Germans and the Italians. Now, in the Mediterranean, they have land-based aviation they can presumably call upon, and they do have a lot of air bases, both in the southern Mediterranean, on the North African coast, and in France itself. So they have air power on call, but they'd still like a carrier capable of operating the Mediterranean. However, they also have the issue of perhaps German commerce raiding, and also potentially deploying a force to the Far East to probably aid the British, because let's be honest, the British aren't along, they're going to be in very big trouble, in deterring or potentially combating the Japanese. Ergo, having a decent aircraft carrier for these duties matters. And that's where the Joffre class come in. The Marine Nationale are obsessed with producing something better than they have had before. Now, if you're looking at this and going, Alex, the lines don't make sense. Is its flight deck offset? Yes. Does its flight deck not extend the full length of the ship? Correct. Is the lift at the back really slightly looking like a house on it? You know, a house that's been sort of turned up onto its side? Yes. Do you have any idea why? I do have. There are reasons for all these things. But the trouble is, as much as I would love to say the French had got through their let's try every idea phase with the burn, and they hadn't. The good idea fairy was still wandering around. Perhaps they were supplying liberal absinthe. I have no idea what's going on here. But again, they have lots of good ideas, which on their own would have been highly interesting. As a collection... Perhaps less so. For example, this lift at the back. It's great. You can bring up aircraft, they could be having their engines already running, and you know they can go straight forward into a takeoff position. Because you've got the arrestor cables in the center of the heart in the center of the ship, the aircraft can land from either direction. That's great. So, you know, it doesn't matter which way the wind's blowing or which direction your ship's going. 
It's far better than the other navies who just position them towards the rear and just go, we're going to be sailing into the wind. You know, this one gives you options. However, let's think about this. If the lift is in elevator position, you now have something sticking out that you might hit as you land. Now, officially, it's supposed to not be in elevated position when you're landing. You're not supposed to be able to clip it or accidentally land on it as you're coming into land. So if it gets jammed, you've got a problem, and then you've definitely got to land from the front. But that's also going to affect your taking off as well. Hmm, it just... It's a nice idea, having this lift, and if you consider, again, the Royal Navy's armoured carriers, they are centre line, forward and aft, armoured hangar in the middle. Makes sense. Well, in the Joffre, that's broadly speaking what you've got in terms of forward and aft lifts. But this one's off centre, which allows you to avoid it if you wish or if it's down or up or whatever it's doing and this one is more of a problem because there isn't a flight deck after it there isn't things to assist you do I think it'd be a massive problem? no I think they'd have adapted how they landed and they'd have been fine but it's an extra complication, which, when you're considering most people are thinking war's going to come coming in the 1940s, you would think you'd be designing everything to be as simple to introduce as possible. Again, that's the thing. It's a lot of good ideas. But you'd normally see one or two of these ideas on a ship. Not all of them. And collectively, they make it a problem. Collectively, they add up. Collectively, the... Well. Collectively, they are made all to improve the operation as it was compared to what was operating on the burn. And especially the lifts. Especially the lifts. And honestly, I've started off by talking about the aft lift, but it's the forward lifts which are even more problematic. The far forward lift, the main lift that served the flight deck, that is so far forward it caused structural issues with the hull and actually the well had to be designed so it was just a center part of the lift which went in and you know, the rest didn't and there's actually a ramp for the aircraft to get on there because if the well had been made any deeper it would have seriously affected and compromised the hull integrity and then there's a third lift which is what serves the lower hanger to the upper hanger and connects smooth. Now the lower hanger is designed into sort of an annex bit and a main hanger area. Annex bit is really for stores, etc. It, it's it's very much a stores space. Theoretically the aircraft could be gotten there, but that's a theory which no one really would want would want to test it. And honestly, again, this makes sense because the lower hanger is a good idea for maintenance aircraft because if you use it for getting aircraft in an operation aircraft, you've got to get the aircraft up between the hangars, up to the first upper hangar, arm them, then get them up to the uh, to the flight deck, and all the way getting around the aircraft, which are doing going through maintenance and all sorts of things. It's just a fretting a nightmare. But if you lose the lower hangar for maintenance, it's great space, and it's something they had done in the burn. Now, interesting enough, in the burn, of course, the aircraft were sent down to the lower hangar on the bottom of the elevators which went up to the upper up to the flight deck yes they had rail system it was all wonderfully engineeringly brilliant um, 
making sure the uh, the rails all lined up even when the fort of the ocean is constantly trying to twist and turn your ship and do all sorts of things to it was great fun, especially in hot and cold weathers. Which, of course, the French Empire doesn't at all cover going through hot and cold, but it makes sense to have the aircraft down and take them up. But again, to get an extra, extra lift in the ship put in. It's good ideas, but it's extra complications. All extra complications. Now... French geostrategic position, as I already explained, was interesting. The French have a problem. They are, under the treaty system, limited to being the same size as Italy in terms of their naval strength. That is their limit. Which means they can either defend themselves against Italy in the Mediterranean and match them, or they can defend their empire, which stretches all around the world. Hence, they have all these bases all around the world. That's a problem. Then you have the fact that there's the rise of the fascist powers, not just Italy, not just Germany, but also Spain. So... France has fascist powers on three corners of her. Germany starts to build up a navy, and France needs to deal with that. There is the Anglo-German naval treaty, but honestly, that's the British trying to get the Germans into the treaty system. It's also, to an extent, a cover for Britain to get a closer look at a lot of German shipyards and pretend to an extent to be fooled by what's going on in there but again we have constructors reports there's a problem with a shipyard there are lots of things you can do in it to make it look unassuming to an untrained inexperienced eye but it's kind of like most of the ships in the treaty system and how they break the treaties Naval constructors from all nations could often tell just by looking at a ship's lines that doesn't quite add up. And of course, when certain Italian cruisers end up in British harbours needing emergency maintenance and repairs, and the British constructors get a very close eye view of them and go, Yeah, we were right. But it's the same for all navies. We often think we treat intelligence like it's intelligence and espionage like it's always some sort of secret work. But often intelligence can be gleaned from open sources and just having experts look at them. Because what can be hidden to a person who is just looking at it and is just generally interested is very different than a person who knows it backwards and forwards. Think about any topic which you are passionate about and you are really interested in. If you see a picture, you will immediately notice if there are issues. Because you know what you're supposed to be looking at. You know what something's supposed to look like. If you spend your life building and designing ships and working in shipyards, and you walk around a shipyard and there are things trying to be hidden and things not quite adding up in terms of what the, your hosts are saying and what you're seeing, you're going to notice it. No matter how nice they are, no matter how complimentary they are, no matter how much alcohol they provide, you're going to notice it. And you're probably going to keep stum and just explain it as a point out when you get home. So the French are in a very, very tight position. They are basically dependent upon the British to give them backup if they find themselves against both Italy and Germany, and also to deal uh, prevent the Japanese from swallowing up their empire. Because Japan on the treaty system is allowed a far larger navy than the French.
this leads us to the particulars of the Drufra class. Going to carry roughly 40 aircraft. They've got some significant armoring. Not massive, but not bad. The strength deck appears to be going to be between the upper and lower hangar. And that would suggest that's where the deck armor is going to be. But there have been some discussions I've read of the deck armor actually, the armor belt, the armor deck actually being below the lower hangar. That doesn't make sense to me. But as I'm using translated sources, and therefore I'm dependent to an extent on the translators, I thought I would mention it. I'm fairly certain myself the, the it's going to be the main hangar deck. Eight water tube boilers supplied two geared stone turbines to drive two shafts. Top speed 33 and a half knots. They are really going to be putting a lot of effort into those shafts. A lot of power is going to have to go through them. But we are talking about an aircraft carrier which is 18,000 tons in standard. So is four to five thousand tons lighter in standard displacement than Ark Royal or Illustrious classes. The French were planning on building two on their treaty allowance. They'd be an interesting ships. How capable they have been? Who knows, but they have a certain allowance and they want to build the best they can on those allowance. They also have another issue in that they have limited space in their yards and they are trying to literally recapitalize them, they, their ships, i.e. replace every capital ship they have with a newer, better one. The French realize a war is coming and they try to build to manage it but there's a limitation on their infrastructure there's a limitation on their supply and there's a limitation on also how well they can get their political class their professional class and their military class to work together because of the fractious politics they've had since World War One you have to remember France as a nation had very nearly cracked in World War I due to the losses and due to the horror that came home in terms of the trauma that had been suffered by a generation and not just really one generation, multiple generations had been fed into the butcher's bill. Sorry, fly behind. I get in a second. So this is what we have. It's a good looking ship in many ways. It's kind of interesting to see the French working on a light fleet carrier and considering what happens in World War II with both the British and the Americans in terms of churning out a light fleet carrier. It would have been highly interesting for a Joffre class to have been completed in service in World War II. It would have been if found in Vichy France, in, in Vichy under Vichy control in France. I have no doubt the British would have made destruction of it in harbour an absolute priority, wherever it was. If it had joined the Allies then I think it would have been incredibly useful. It is perhaps one of the things which would have been most useful deployed to Norway or other operations. Unlike the burn which spent most of World War II either acting as an aircraft transport, um, just floating in place or being used occasionally as an escort carrier, a Joffre could really have been used for operations. Interesting enough, I doubt those operations would have been in the Mediterranean. 
I have a feeling, especially the British in terms of alliance, would have looked at it and gone, yeah, do you realize how many armor-piercing bombs and heavy bombs and dive bombers are going around the training? Do you really want to give that a try? Hopefully they went, no, they'd have gone, no. Air group-wise, especially, again, it's interesting because the French Navy gain control, complete control their fleet air arm, regain control fleet air, control their fleet air arm earlier than the Royal Navy, so they had longer to put their ideas forward into designs and to have complete control of the process. So, again, for the Joffres coming through, there was an interesting generation of aircraft. I'm not necessarily keen on them all. I think some of them... And I might be getting into these aircraft next year, if uh, with because I'm planning to do alongside key ships, key naval aircraft next year. If I do the aircraft carrier flagship year, which fairly certain is going to what it's going to be, then well, the aircraft are interesting. They have interesting ideas, and it would have been complementary capabilities certainly some of our allied aircraft, but also I could see this carrier being able to be rapidly converted to British, maybe even American aircraft types without too much difficulty. Although I have a feeling both British and American constructors when they saw the forward lift and the compromises that introduced to the hull might be going um, we can't change this at the moment, but why not just a few feet further aft? Why put it at this extremity? Anyway, good ships. I always end my videos with a question, and I'm not going to change that practice now. I like the Joffre class, broadly speaking. I think... They have some tendencies coming into them that, frankly, are leftovers from the burn. But the more I look into them, the more I respect that the French have tried to push past the burn and the issues that it caused, and have tried to go for something better. It's still got issues. Tremendous issues. But compared to the burn, it is a very functional carrier. So, there is often a question put out on this channel, and there's often various, I think there's even a patron question live right now on the patron vote of if the Italians have an aircraft carrier, and there's variations of if the Germans had an aircraft carrier on there as well. But very rarely has the question been asked, what happens if the French have something better than the Bern in service? So what happens if the Joffres, let's say both of them, had actually been finished prior to World War II. What do you think the French aircraft carriers get up to? Where do you think they are? Do you think there's one sitting in the Far East? Do you think there's they're operating with task groups? Are they out positioned with, I don't know, the Dunkirks? Running around the world as hunter-killer groups? That would make sense. Fast battleship, fast carrier, go off and hunt surface raiders. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. What have we got coming up? Ooh. This will be the 8th of September, I think. He says, just checking. Yes, 8th of September. So, we've got the uh, winning a war. Hosendorf, an unrestricted submarine warfare. Mm, that's going to be cool. Hope you enjoy, and take care. Thank you for watching.